So hear these words from Psalm 121. I lift my eyes to the hills. From where will my help come from? My help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. He will not let your foot be moved. He who keeps you will not slumber. He who keeps Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord is your keeper. The Lord is your shade at your right hand. The sun will not strike you by day nor the moon by night. The Lord will keep you from all evil. He will keep your life. The Lord will keep your going out and your coming in from this time on and forevermore. So welcome to week two of the Christian season of Lent, or as I like to call it, Christian New Year, uh, because it's a lot like the beginning of the year in that people uh, make a lot of resolutions about how they're going to change so that they can grow and improve in the next 365 days. Now, we try in this season to deepen our relationship with God through spiritual disciplines. Some people will deny themselves certain things. Some people will take certain things on. And then, of course, there's the oldies but goodies, things like prayer, reading scripture, things like that. But there's an awful lot that goes on in our lives that tests this process. And a lot of the times, it's physical. Now, I found some troubling data while researching this sermon. And I really hope I don't depress some people with it. University of Scranton psychology professor John C. Norcross has studied resolutions for decades. The data says that while 40% of Americans set New Year's resolutions, over 60% will fail within six months. Yeah. However, if you believe strongly enough in your ability to succeed at a resolution, you are 10 times more likely to make the change that you seek versus someone who didn't make a resolution but knows they need to make that same change. 10 times. Belief is a very strong force, but I think we all understand that it has its limitations. And those limits are largely dictated by the things that we're predisposed to believe in. These things are based on our biases. So for example, if you hate to run, chances are that you're not gonna be able to muster up enough belief to stick to a fitness program that revolves around running. You're literally doomed to failure from the very start because you're not a runner. To increase the likelihood of succeeding at a fitness resolution, because that's what you wanted, right? You wanted to be physically fit. Maybe you wanted to lose weight or just improve your health. Well, maybe you probably shouldn't find a way to work running into that regimen, right? No matter how cute the shoes are, how much you enjoy staring at other runners, or how badly you want to convince other people that you are, in fact, a runner. It behooves you to try to find something different to accomplish your goal. Now, this idea might seem really simple, but it's incredibly powerful when it comes to our religion. Isn't it strange how Christianity seems to bless some people, but not others? Or how some Christians behave very differently than others when it comes to matters of faith? One of the easiest ways that I know to illustrate this principle is when the Christian find themselves, finds themselves in a tough spot. Uh, so I want you to really think on the last time, and this may be a painful process for some. Um, But you're safe here. This is God's house. God will keep watch over us. I want you to think on the last time you may have felt abandoned or perhaps overwhelmed emotionally, physically, spiritually, afraid. Maybe it was frustrated or grieving, um, in pain, maybe physical or emotional. And you might find that in that time, you asked, where are you, God? So have you noticed how the wind has been howling recently? I have noticed something in my time here in Maryland about the weather. 
Um, just before a big change in the weather uh, comes through, there seems to be a lot of wind. It kind of whips up. It's not something I'm acquainted with as a Southern Californian. It's like it's an indicator that something significant is about to blow on through. The first few times I encountered the wind, it scared me, especially at night. The way that it would whip over the land and down hills with a roar, or uh, it would make strange rushing or whistling sounds as it uh, went around buildings or through windows, all the little cracks and crevices you don't notice until suddenly the wind blows and you hear the whistle. Now wind is frequently associated with change. The winds of change are blowing, some will say. Did you know that the Holy Spirit is equated with wind in Scripture? In the Old Testament, the word for wind is ruach, and it's also the word used to describe the Holy Spirit, ruach ha-kodesh. Wind, like change, can be terrifying, especially when it tears things down, but it's also a welcome thing when it gives us nice weather, or in large cities, it cleans the air, it pushes the pollution that we create, away. It helps us to breathe a little bit better. But sometimes it brings with it things that we don't care for. I live right next to a dump. Sometimes the wind blows and it stinks in my neighborhood. Or maybe something that like affects your allergies. We're getting ready to enter spring. Seasonal allergies are a thing. Change is a lot like that. Which is probably why so many people fail at their New Year's resolutions. I mean, it's rarely easy, and it often yields unexpected results. It can be terrifying or refreshing. Most people don't handle change well, and there are many medical studies that show that it doesn't matter if change in your life brings positive or negative results, it still stresses your body. You have within your body a thing called a cortisol response. When you get stressed, whether positively or negatively, it builds up. And I think it's a real shame. Not so much the way that God knit us together, but it almost seems as if we're predisposed to reject change. Now, faith in Jesus can seem like nothing we... Uh, I'm sorry, faith in Jesus seems like... Well, it feels like something that we need to do on our own. But it's not. Jesus made it clear to the Pharisee Nicodemus that only the power of the Holy Spirit filling us can help us succeed in having faith. He called it being born from above or born again. Now, if we relied purely on our own faculties, our own strength, I can tell you that we would never get there. There's simply too many things going on in our lives to keep us from having faith. And quite frankly, it's almost as if we lack the equipment necessary to do it. Now, a wind blows around anything in its path. When you're in an enclosed vehicle, you're not going to feel the wind whipping all around you. It's only when you open the windows or the sunroof, or maybe if you're fortunate enough to drive a convertible when you let the top down, that you suddenly realize the presence of the wind. It was always there, but now you're open to feeling it. It blows around the car, it blows stuff around in the car, it messes up your hair. You might not appreciate the feeling much if the only reason you opened up the windows was to freshen the air in the car. Got to do that from time to time. But sometimes you want to let the breeze in. You've got the music cranked up, you're driving down some beautiful road. And in those times, it's exhilarating, it's refreshing. Now, the, the gospel lesson this morning is um, it's a little bit of a strange one, but it contains a familiar verse that is known the world over. You see it at almost any televised football game. I'm talking about John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he sent his only Son, that whoever believes in him might not perish but have eternal life. Some would say that it is the most important verse in the entire Bible. It seems to imply that believing in Jesus will give us eternal life, kind of a one-and-done proposition. 
I'm not saying that to turn it into a caricature, but that's how it kind of reads, that if I believe in Jesus, I will somehow have eternal life. I think our culture has done something strange to the word belief. And I don't think it jives with scripture. See, for most people, faith and belief might as well be the same thing. If you ask Joe Schmo on the street, hey, what's the difference between faith and belief? People will come up with a myriad of answers. But faith and belief are not the same thing, at least in my opinion. Believing in Jesus is more than something you do with your mind right? The author of the Gospel of John never intended for belief and action to be separate things. They are together. That's just something that we have done with it. For the author of John, a belief in Jesus is reflected in your heart and in your life. The changes that you make in your heart often manifest in your life. It's evident in the way that you treat God, the way that you treat yourself, the way that you treat others. Our culture has separated doing from believing. It's like they stand apart from each other. Belief now is anything you've just settled in your mind. We have literally lumped believing in Jesus together with believing in gravity or that in a few hours the night will come. No, Jesus tries to explain to this Pharisee that when both men talk about belief, they are literally talking about two different things, which is why Nicodemus just doesn't understand what Jesus is telling him. But you know, it's interesting where this story of Jesus takes place in Scripture. See, Nicodemus visits Jesus the very night after he drove all the money changers out of the temple. What a event that was. Now, as pleasant as this exchange between Nicodemus and Jesus seems to go, I want to assure you that this was not a social call. Jesus had stirred the hornet's nest with his actions in the temple that day. It didn't matter that the words that he'd spoken were the truth, that the temple had become little more than a meal ticket for the Jewish religious establishment, and that they were pushing a theology that was failing to create real transformation in people's lives. It was failing to give people hope when more than 90% of people living in those days had just enough money to feed themselves for one day. Forget about savings or owning property. The status quo had just been disrupted. Jesus asked the questions that needed to be asked. And the Jewish hierarchy was in full-on damage control mode. So one of their best comes in the dead of night when no one could see him going out or coming in to interrogate the Savior. And what Jesus said or didn't say in that moment could have ended up creating a great deal of trouble for him. It did. But instead of reading about this story as an interrogation, people going forward in time, people like us, read about this exchange between two men and it has become symbolic of something that Jesus continues to be known for, the reason that you're here, and that is the way that Jesus creates life-altering life-giving transformation. But transformation like wind is only perceived when we allow it. Our biases, our pain, has a way of blocking us off from change, particularly when it comes to the changes that we need to be making. One of the first things you can do if you find yourself in a situation like that is to do exactly the opposite of what you're likely doing when you think of your failure to make change in your life, which is, usually, to get down on yourself and start assigning blame. Instead, you might try forgiving yourself, because nobody is perfect. No one is perfect. And you are going to fail again and again. It is a fact of life. And God knows this. 
But God also knows. Hear this, church. God also knows that you were not designed to fail. I know this because I allowed myself to open my heart to the Lord one day, and I realized that the piece that I was missing was the part that God has to play in my life. Even now, in my weakest times, I still think I can go it alone. I have a predisposition to do that, but I'm getting better at realizing that God is in fact my ally particularly in the tough times, and that in my going out or coming in, I won't stumble because God ensured my success by making our relationship possible. It is my faith in God, the cultivation of our relationship, that gives me victory when I need it, strength when I'm at my lowest. It keeps my chin up on the hardest days because I know that I am blessed. We are designed, brothers and sisters, to work in tandem with our Creator. This is the way that God willed it. We are not to be separate. We are always to be together. And this is why we practice things like Lent. Sometimes we just need to be reminded to care for that relationship, because in the care of the relationship, we find successful transformation. When we care for our faith, the windows stay open. The winds of change blow on through. They freshen the air. If you feel stuck, like your life is not going the way that you want it, maybe you feel alone all the time or frustrated, weighed down by your cares. You don't feel like you're making any forward movement. Well, consider asking yourself, if perhaps you've closed yourself off from God, if you've convinced yourself that you can't depend on anyone else and so you just have to go it alone, nothing is further from the truth. Maybe you just need a fresh perspective or a change of heart. Who knows? Ask God to give it to you in the name of Jesus. God is rooting for you. If you can believe that, you will find the transformation that you seek. Amen.